Okay, so our next example is about production and some kind of storing or inventory decision. So when we are making decisions, in many cases, we may also consider what will happen in the future. This is going to create some multi-period problems. Okay, so in many cases, for example, when we are making products, those products produced today may be used to be sold in the future if we carefully store them as inventory, okay? And we may do that with several reasons. So first, daily capacity may not be enough, okay? So many products, they have peak season and off-peak seasons. So maybe your products, they are sold, and they are more popular during, for example, weekends. So weekdays, no one wants to buy, but for weekends, many people want to buy your product. Then you may need to produce more during weekdays and make inventories. Maybe production cost is different from day to day. So in cheaper days, you want to produce more. Maybe the price is higher in the future. So there can be all kinds of reasons for us to consider inventory. So now let's consider an example where the production decision is jointly considered with inventory decisions. So the decision is here. We now again produce and sell. Let's make it easier. Let's consider just one product. For the coming four days, the marketing manager has promised the customers to fulfill the following amount of demands. So for day one, two, three, and four, for each of the day, you need to produce and sell 100 units, 150 units, 200 units, and 170 units. So more precisely, these are the sales quantity to be, to be realized, okay? And once we do that, then we are able to earn some money, of course. But the thing is that we need to, we need to satisfy these demands. We need to realize these sales. And of course, we don't need to produce that product to be sold in that day. Why is that? Because the production costs are different for the, first, the four days. Okay, Making things in the first day seems to be cheaper. In the second day, somehow it's going to be more exp exp expensive. For example, maybe this particular day is a holiday. If you ask your employees to come, you need to pay more. Something like that. So that creates some chances for you to optimize your decision by considering inventory. For consider inventory somehow that requires us to connect these periods. We want to maximize profits and because we assume all the pri prices to sell your products are all fixed. So profit maximization is the same as cost minimization. So for this problem, we're going to try to minimize our cost. So now let's consider inventory. We may store a product and sell it later. And if we pay $1 per unit per day, we will be able to do that. So that $1 per unit per day, they, that forms the inventory cost, or sometimes it's also called holding cost. Okay, or some people call it inventory holding cost. Oh, but anyway, that's the cost you need to pay to carry one unit of product from today to tomorrow. So very quickly, you may evaluate several solutions. For example, you may say, okay, I want to have a lot of inventory. So I'm going to produce 620 units. Why 620? Because the sum of all these demands is 620. I want to produce everything on day one and then carry inventory to fulfill future demands. So if I do that, then my cost would be the following. I need to pay $9 for all the production. And then for 105, uh, 150 units, I need to pay $1 of inventory holding cost because I need to carry 150 units by one day. For these 200 units, I need to pay $2 of inventory cost for each unit because I carry each unit by two days, okay? Because I produce this amount 200 and carry it two days to be sold on day two. So for the last batch, 170 units, each of them I need to pay $3. So 
Overall, the total cost may be calculated, which is six thousand and six hundred and forty. So you may consider that as one candidate. There are, of course, other candidate plans. For example, the other extreme is that you pay nine dollars to produce one hundred units. You pay twelve dollars to 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 produce one hundred and fifty units. Ten dollar for two hundred. Twelve dollars for one hundred and seventy. You may get another cost, but either one may not be optimal because they are just too extreme. There may be some other ways to do the inventory decision. Okay, so now let's see how to do that. Let's pre、uh, make it more precise. So for each day, let's say. At the beginning, we have some beginning inventory on day T, and T may be one, two, three, or four. Okay. So every day when you wake up, there are some on hand inventory you have. Okay. And then you are going to make some production, and for that day you may quickly make some products, and then you may sell them. Okay. And then lastly, you have your ending inventory when you go to sleep. So pretty much we have this equation. Your beginning inventory plus the amount you produce minus the amount you sell becomes your ending inventory, and we follow the convention to say that inventory costs are calculated according to your ending inventory. So whatever amount you have for tonight, you carry them to the next day. You pay inventory. So if you produce one hundred and fifty units for today. And then you sell those one hundred and fifty units on that day. There is no inventory cost to occur. So now we are ready to formulate our problem. We are going to decide the production quantity for each day, right? And of course, now we also need to decide how much, how many to leave to the next day. So let's say this is our ending inventory for each day. Y T is our ending inventory for day T. So here it's very important to say we are talking about ending inventory, because if we don't specify ending, we don't know whether it's beginning inventory or ending inventory. All right. So it's important to make your formulation to make your pre、uh, description precise. So with that, the objective function can be easily obtained. This first part is our production cost for each day, and we collect all of them. That's the total production cost, and then according to our inventory amount for each day, we have the total ending、uh, total inventory cost. Here we don't have coefficient because that's one dollar per day. Um, and then now we need to keep an eye on our inventory. We need to calculate the amount. Of y according to our decision x, so that's not too difficult because we already have that equation, right? So pretty much for day one, initially you have nothing. So your y one, your ending inventory is x one minus one hundred. All right, so that's the first thing. And then for the second day, the second day is that your y one plus x two minus one hundred and fifty. Becomes your y two, whatever amount you have at the beginning, plus the amount you add into your inventory, minus the amount you sell becomes the ending amount you have. For the other two days, that's the same thing. Okay, these are typically called the inventory balancing constraints. So we are calculating our inventory levels according to these equations. Of course, we need to satisfy all the demands, right? So for day one, x one is the only source of inventory. So x one must be at least one hundred. That's fine. For day two, we need to have enough amount to be sold. That's y one plus x two. That should be at least one hundred and fifty, and so on and so on. And then all the numbers should be non-negative. So collectively, we have our formulation. This is our objective function. These are inventory balancing constraints, and then we have four inequalities. They are demand fulfillment constraints, and then finally, finally we have non-negativity constraints.
So this is pretty much our first first version formulation for this particular problem. The interesting thing is that we want to go through this example more deeply to give you the idea of simplification. May we simplify the formulation? Actually, we can, as long as we do some more deeper observations. The interesting thing is that inventory balancing and non-negativity actually imply demand fulfillment. Why does that? For example, in day one, we already know that your y1 is calculated based on x1 minus 100. It also tells you that y1 must be non-negative, right? The ending inventory amount must be non-negative. So if that's the case, directly it says x1 minus 100 must be non-negative, right? And that just means demand fulfillment. And if you take a look at each day, that's the same thing. As long as your ending inventory is non-negative, then you fulfill all the demands. So actually, you only need inventory balancing and non-negativity constraints. You don't really need those demand fulfillment constraints. It's fine to conclude that they are redundant. And the redundant constraint means if we remove those redundant constraints, the feasible region remain identical. So if we are able to find redundant constraints and remove them, that of course reduces the complexity of a program. And if eventually we input our model into a computer solver, that may help us save some time to make the solution easier to be obtained. In fact, you may have one additional observation. You may argue that there is no reason to have ending inventory in period 4, right? Because we will stop our planning in period 4. So if we have something left over at the end of period 4, it costs us some money, but it is useless. So once we see that, there is no reason to have Y4. And Y4, or you may say Y4 may be set to 0 directly. So that's also a correct observation. So this formulation here is also correct and somehow is equivalent to previous ones. However, here I need to tell you another thing. This is good, but this is not always suggested. This is not always uh, encouraged, at least at this stage, at this beginning stage. Why is that? Uh, whatever program we have, eventually we will input them into a solver to try to have the solver solve it. If we observe that in an optimal solution, y4 will be 0, your solver will also see it. So it doesn't really matter whether you see it by yourself. Okay? If you do a lot of observation and just remove one single variable, that does not help too much. Especially if eventually you work on practical problems. All your practical problems, their scale would be very large. Thousands of constraints, thousands of variables. Typically, there's no way for you to use your human judgment, to use your careful observation to see something is not necessary. So I would say, in general, simplification is very good. But in most cases, it is not so necessary. So if you want to do some simplification of your program, uh, you may try, but I won't say it's necessary. I won't say it's necessary.